so we're going to read uh, Luke chapter 24, and we're going to start with verse 13 through uh, 35. Yep, I got that right. Through 35. And this, of course, is the two uh, disciples on the road to Emmaus. Now that same day, two of them are going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem? Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, How foolish you are! How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken! Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. While he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while, we talked, while he talked to us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem, where they found the eleven, and those with them assembled together, and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way, and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. This is the word of the Lord. All right, so this is a post-Easter passage that I'm reading before Easter, and the reason is, well, I guess God's Spirit started speaking to me through it, so I wanted to talk about it. But I specifically thought it would be appropriate to talk about it because we all know what happens on Easter morning, right? Jesus rises again. And so I want to talk about Easter this year in a way that sort of acknowledges that implicitly. And this is all about the message that Jesus is alive again and how we appear to these two disciples. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the prayer summit. Um, Partly because so many good things. So this is the vehicle I rented. I rented a fairly nondescript Dodge Journey. And the reason I rented it was because I could sleep in the back. And um, that's sort of kind of weird. But, you know, we go to a conference. You pay 150 bucks a night for a motel room. And then you sleep in it about six or seven hours a night. So I thought, why not have some fun and sleep in the back of an SUV? And it turns out that it caused a lot of adventures. The last night I was there, I slept on top of a mountain, which was uh, absolutely amazing, but that's another story, I guess. But I just had a great time. Aside from my uh, personal entertainment renewal uh, adventure, there were so many good things that happened at the prayer summit. And one of the good things was uh, the prayer, but more than that, I was just so encouraged by the amount of great things that are happening, even within the Christian Reformed Church and sort of on the periphery of the Christian Reformed Church, too. So when I started the series on hospitality, I talked a little bit about the difficulty in the Christian Reformed Church, which is that a third of our churches are sort of fading, they're growing older, and they're losing members, and unless something changes in five or ten years, they're going to be um, even worse off than they are now. A third of our churches are doing well by, doing, by being traditional. They're, they're traditional Christian Reformed churches, and they're doing fairly well in that, and they're probably continue to do well in that for the foreseeable future. And then I said, a third of our churches are doing well by being really faithful and trying to be churches in their community. And uh, they're doing well in that, whether they're growing or not, they're really being faithful and, and just great expressions of the body of Christ in their particular community. Of those, about a third of them, so 10% total, are probably growing evangelistically, uh, outreach in ways that uh, new people are coming to faith. So that's sort of the good news and the bad news. Um, but 
in the mix of all of that at this prayer center, what we saw is God is doing amazing things even within the Christian Reformed Church. And it's sort of sometimes outside of the local, fairly established uh, um, sort of congregation or church. But God is doing amazing, amazing things. And Moses talked a little bit about the people in um, Egypt and Pakistan. So a friend of mine whose name is Naji Umran, went to seminary with him years ago, married an Egyptian woman, and they're living in Egypt now. And him and a guy named Dr. Faid are basically engaged with helping the refugees from Syria and Iraq. So in, in uh, Egypt, there's these huge refugee camps of people from Syria and Iraq. He says they're going to get sent back pretty quick, but right now they're there. And so this guy, he used to be an engineer, Dr. Faid, um, basically is sending young people to minister to these people in refugee camps. And from what they said, like thousands of these people from these countries who were uh, Muslim are becoming followers of Jesus Christ. Again, as you know, through dreams and visions and prophetic revelation, they're just seeing that they need to come to Christ. And then there's people there to disciple them. And he has this whole training program, and he talked about that. But the cool thing is that God is using uh, people within the fairly traditional church to support this, and he's just moving in tremendous ways. And I thought that was such a powerful antidote to the message of fear that we're often given in our culture or by the, uh, by the news media. This is fear, 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 fear. But um, turns out that when God moves people from one place to another, they're more open to different cultural things. They're more open to the gospel. So that was just tremendously encouraging to hear stories like that. Another thing that was encouraging was a woman from All Nations Church, which is a Christian Reformed uh, Korean church, about five or 6,000. I'm not sure how many people go there now, but again, it's a Christian Reformed church, about 5,000 people. Uh, this lady became a missionary somewhere down in South America and is ministering to refugees there somehow, and just was so exhausted coming to the prayer summit. But as she heard these stories, as she received prayer, uh, God moved in her life, and you could tell she had this deep strength, but it was just completely drained. And by the end, when Moses and some other people prayed for her, she was so filled and just weeping that finally someone could care for her when she had been caring for so many other people. And it was just encouraging to see the body of Christ come around. We met in a Christian Reformed church. Uh, this kind of breaks our worldview a little bit. Uh, that's called Tokamsa. I finally learned how to say it. Maybe. <laughs> Tok Tokamsa Mission Church. It's a church about 15 years old. They started off and they said that we want to give 90% of our budget to missions. And so they did. 90% of their budget to missions. I'm not sure. I, you know, I kind of wanted in the back of my mind, what are they paying their pastor? I have no idea. <laughs> but that aside, uh, <laughs> they, uh, they're just doing amazing things. And he told this story about the Calvin College choir coming out and, uh, and sort of convicting them. You see, they give uh, grain, apparently, often to North Korea because, well, you know what happens in North Korea. So they had proposed to give a certain amount of grain to North Korea. And uh, they got a request for more, and they're like, no, no, no. But then this choir from Calvin came, and they sang a song in Korean. And he said, I don't know if they knew what they were singing, but it was something about, uh, if you leave me now, may your feet rot in five miles, right? I, you know, I know there's these folk songs in America, but you know, when you hear it, a new one in another language, it's just as funny. Do you guys know that song? I don't know, it's a weird song, right? But I thought that's a good, uh, that's a sort of good insult. If you leave me, may your feet rot. Wow. So they heard that and they thought, they all felt convicted, like, you know, maybe God is telling us, don't leave our brothers in North Korea. So they raised more money. I don't know, the number was so huge, I could hardly believe it, but it was tons, tons of grain that this one church had, uh, had given to North Korea. So there's amazing things happening within the Christian Reformed Church, and it was so encouraging. And then, I won't show you everything here, but I was in the youth room last night, and John has these shirts that he got, and uh, it's basically a yellow shirt, which I like, but it says, Love, uh, Mercy, and it reminds me of the old home missions church uh, shirt set. I think they used to have like this three-part thing. And it just reminded me that, you know, we're in this gospel thing because of love and mercy. We're in this thing, Easter matters, that we gather together so that we can be the church to people who don't know much about Jesus, who don't know much about God's mercy. This is why I stand up and preach every single week, almost every single week, even though it's incredibly difficult, even though Saturdays I get uh, pre-message syndrome. Um, this is why. It's not just so that we can... Uh, 
rhapsodize and think uh, fancily about grace or the gospel is because of very concrete reasons we are called to give mercy to love mercy and to give love and and help people who don't know the light of Christ haven't seen the light of Christ in very concrete specific ways whether it's telling them the good news or whether it's actually demonstrating that good news that's why we do this that's why we worship that's why uh, we sing as the song says so um, you know, sleeping in a, in a van on top of a mountain is awesome, but I was just encouraged by the message. So here we have uh, two people in this passage who are not at a good point in their lives. Eventually, they will get at a good point again, and they will share the good news. But right now, they're not at a good point in their lives. It's difficult. And so the general arc of the message that I want to give this morning is goes along this lines. Uh, life is first up, then down, and then up again. That's often the trajectory of our life when we come to Jesus. First up, we get excited, then down, it's difficult, and then up again. Or when we feel convicted to get into a new ministry, right? And like, it's first up, we're excited, we're amazed, we're so thrilled that something could happen. And then down, Bad things happen, and we get spiritually attacked. Someone comes in our house and takes all our electronics. And then up, it works out, and God moves with power. It's the trajectory of so many parts of the Christian life. And so it's in this passage this morning, and that's sort of the framework that I want to use this morning. So I have a little bit of a different way to present Scripture this morning. We'll see if it works. A little bit glitchy. But, uh, but there we go. All right, it's kind of slick. Again, it doesn't really matter, but this is the passage. So that same day, two of them are going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. This is a down part already, but these two people have been part, more than likely, of the whole Passover celebration in Jerusalem. They had seen Jesus come over the hill from Jericho. They might have been with him at Bethphage. They probably were with him when they got on that donkey and the crowd shouted, Hoshana, Hoshana, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, right? And they were there, and it was a time of great celebration because they realized that now was the time, they believed now was the time that Jesus was finally going to reveal himself and finally push back against the Romans and be the religious and political leader. And it was an amazing time. So it was first up, they were excited that Jesus had been going from height to height. And it seemed like now he was finally going to be the Messiah. And it was amazing. But then as we know, the story of Easter unfolds and everything that they hoped for, all of a sudden, completely fell apart. Men down. As this passage goes on, it becomes apparent uh, what's happening. So Jesus had died. He had risen, but they didn't really know he was alive. It was kind of confusing. And so these two in individuals, Cleopas and one other guy, are walking back from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and they don't really know what to do, so they have to go home eventually. I mean, the pastor was over. They probably had responsibilities. And they're walking, and they're discussing things that have happened. And if you've had something bad happen to you, you know that when that happens, your brain just goes a thousand different directions and you need to discuss it with somebody. When something bad happens, your brain just sort of needs an avenue, needs a way out, and you have to talk about it. So what do you do? You do whatever your brain wants you to do as long as it's not illegal or immoral because there's got to sort it out somehow. Here they are, they're walking along, they're discussing it, and Jesus comes up to them and he asks them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And I love this. How Jesus just comes up and asks them this question, right? You know, he knows what they're talking about, what they're thinking about. It. He knows everything about them, but yet he asks this question. And then it says, um, they stood still, their faces downcast. Another translation is, they stood still, looking sad. Right? Bad things happen. They have been discussing this with each other, but when Jesus asked them, they were so down, they were so stunned, they were so depressed, or whatever, that all they could do, they couldn't even respond to Jesus. They just stood there and said, well, nothing. And finally, one of them finds the energy and says this. He says, um, 
Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem? Or as this text says, are you the only one? Are you visiting? It says it both ways, but really it probably says it this way. Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Like, where, like what, where have you been? You see, what happens when bad things happen is that it seems like the world should stop, uh, but it doesn't. Or as one story says, when bad things happen, it seems like you should die, but you don't. You just keep living. And these two people have had something very difficult in life happen, and they just can't even comprehend that someone would not know what has happened, because this was a hugely significant event. And then Jesus says, what does he say? He says, what things? And I love this whimsy of Jesus, right? Because he knows. But he doesn't say, you know, he, it was him. But he says, what things? And when I think about this, like, this is the way Jesus interacts with us. And I wish I was uh, a little bit more like this, where I had the same whimsy. I could just ask one simple question instead of sort of giving the answer and sort of over-functioning. But this is a good indication for how the Spirit speaks in our life. Because often God knows where he wants to take you, but he gets there by asking a question like, what things? What things? When you're down... Often God answers, asks you a question or brings something in your life, something like this, and often it's just one or two words. What? And he gives them a chance to tell them about their own difficulty. And they go on and they say, well, you know, all our hopes were put on this one guy, Jesus. We thought he was going to redeem Israel. We thought it was going to be awesome. And now it's the third day since all this took place and it doesn't seem like anything is going to happen because he's not alive. He's not, doesn't seem like he's in the tomb and we have no idea what's going to happen. It's so difficult. And so, uh, you know, the story goes on, and eventually, uh, Jesus says to them, you know, you're so slow to believe. He says, you foolish uh, people. And again, if you've ever experienced the conviction of Jesus, it's kind of like this. It's like, basically, Jesus says to them, you're so dumb. Right? He says, you're so dumb. He says, you foolish people. And... It's the conviction of Jesus that comes with force, but it comes with the love, too. And if you ever felt this, it's just like God just convicts us. It's spot on, but it comes with love. He says, you foolish people. Like, you just don't get it. And beginning with the prophets and beginning with Moses and the prophets, so two sections out of the Old Testament, uh, there's the prophets, there's, there's, a, there's a law which is written by Moses, there's the prophets, and there's the writings. He says out of these two sections of the Old Testament, he began to explain to them that Jesus must suffer these things, and then on the third day, rise again. So he begins to explain to them from the Old Testament what's going on. So he teaches them, he shows them. And so when things, when things go down, how do you get back up? Well, there's a couple of lessons in here when things are difficult. First of all, like I said earlier, you've got to do what your heart leads you to do. You've got to take that walk. You've got to have that uh, sort of discussion with somebody. And then something has to happen where you have to listen. You have to listen to Scripture, listen to the people in your life, listen to the way Jesus is talking to you, listen to the things he's trying to impress upon your heart. Somehow, Jesus has to come into our lives and teach us what he wants us to learn through the Scripture and through the things he's convicting upon our hearts. First up, then down, and that comes with a path of learning, a path of listening, and then eventually, of course, up. As they approached the village to which you're going, Jesus continued as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening. So he went in to stay with them. What's going on here? Well, they're offering hospitality like we've been talking about. A few weeks ago, Cynthia had the kids up here, and she said, uh, one of the things I want you kids to do, the girls to do, is talk to strangers, right? And then I led that class last week, and sure enough, on the wall, there's a whole litany of things that she encourages them to do. It's sort of this nice poster thing. And in the middle there, again, it says, talk to strangers. Now, we don't want our young girls talking to strangers that are older guys and kind of freaky, but the lesson in here is, is that we are invited to talk to strangers. And here, these uh, two people do it, And they end up meeting Jesus, and then they offer hospitality, and they experience Jesus in their lives. And I talked to a lot of strangers this week, and I just want to share that. This is true. When you talk to strangers, people you don't know, about Jesus, and maybe they teach you things about Jesus, maybe you teach them about Jesus, but we get in the grow. And if you're in a downtime, this is one of the ways 
that we get out of that time and begin to experience the presence of Jesus. So what happens in this particular case? While they were at the table with him, he took the bread, broke it, and gave thanks. Now, uh, when we do communion, as you can see, we use this nice sort of uh, bread. It's not quite Wonder Bread anymore, but it's nice bread with yeast in it. It's nice little squares. It tastes good. And then you um, have the wine, which is actually grape juice. But in that time, uh, they would have used unleavened bread. Remember, the Passover is just done, so they wouldn't have had leaven in their house. They wouldn't have had yeast in their house at all. They would have just gotten back from Jerusalem. I don't even know where they got the bread. Maybe a neighbor. And so... You know, this is a nice blueberry bagel that I found at home this morning, but it would have been a very flat bread, so we'll just pretend this has no yeast in it. It would have been a very flat bread, like this, and for some reason, Jesus would have grabbed it and offered it. It didn't say they asked him to, but you know how these meals work. If you take the initiative, then you can do it. So what he would have done is he would have said, he would have grabbed the bread, and according to the Jewish tradition, he would have said, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, who brings forth bread from the earth. And it says that as he gave it to them, they recognized who he was. I never saw that before. He broke the bread, said, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, who brings forth bread from the earth. And in so doing, he would have given them an analogy that he himself had come forth from the earth. And then it says, as he gave it to them, so he handed it to them, and that's when they recognized him. So as he did that, he gave them the bread, but he also gave them insight that he himself was Jesus and that he himself was risen from the dead. And then he disappeared. Gone. No longer there. And you always kind of wonder, like, maybe you don't always kind of wonder, but I have sort of wondered from time to time, did he take the bread with him? Did that disappear too? Or did he leave some? <laughs> you know, you just got to wonder, like, what happened? So they would have had some bread. He probably left the bread there. But uh, these stories are worth dwelling on uh, for some time. They were so excited, they went back to Jerusalem and told everybody there. And they soon realized that uh, this, is, this is Jesus. He's alive, and, and he's no longer dead. And, and all of a sudden, they, they get up again in the sense they realized what Jesus was doing the whole time. And of course, God had it worked out the whole time. They just didn't know it. So what's the lesson in here for us? Well, there's probably a lot. But what I want to share this morning is along this line. It's easy in the church, especially on Sunday morning, to just pretend that we're always up. And it's easy to sort of wake up on Sunday morning and have all sorts of difficulty during the week and even have difficulty on Sunday morning and get in arguments about whether the shirt's ironed or where the car keys are and come to church and finally put on a sort of veneer of decency because we're in church. Or even it's on another level, it's really easy to have difficult problems during the week and never really share those difficult problems. But the trajectory and the experience of Christianity isn't one that's always up. This is actually part of the intentional pattern of God because there is difficulty in the world. So I talk about this often, but I think the analogy in this passage is really helpful because we don't live lives where everything is perfect all the time, and we don't need to pretend that we do. The pattern in Christianity and Christian living is actually, yeah, we're first up, we see Jesus, we get excited, the Spirit comes, gives us fruit, gives us gifts. Or we get called into a new ministry like, let's say, Justice or the Friday night ministry for women. And we get excited, we get amazed at what the potential is, and it's awesome, and it's wonderful. But then difficulty happens, and pretty much anybody who started any new ministry in this church in the last four or five years ends up getting attacked in some way. And i just kind of realizing that more and more. So if someone says they're going to start a new ministry, uh, pray for them, so pray for Merv, pray for the uh, Friday night uh, people. Um, pray for anyone who's doing anything new, because there is always a difficult time after that. And pray for anyone who continues to do anything new. Um, there's always difficulty. Things get tough. And why is that? Well, the enemy doesn't like good things to happen, but also what's happening is God is preparing us with new levels of understanding, new levels of spiritual power, new levels of gifts and fruit to do the thing that he called us to do. It's just that the path is often more difficult 
than we think. A friend of mine said, when God calls you to do something, he tells you what ABC is and he tells you what XYZ is, but the middle part is really ambiguous and often involves a lot of suffering. So life is always like this. First you're up and then, and then it's down. And when you're down, when it's down, the, the thing to do isn't to sort of doubt the promises of God and to wonder where God is and wonder why bad things are happening. The thing to do is really found in this passage here is to do the next right thing. So if you're not home and you need to go home, walk home. It's to talk to people, right? It's to talk to your friends about the difficulty and the, the difficult things that are going on. Talk them out. It's to talk to strangers, to get resources from other people, to talk to people who don't know anything about you. And when someone comes up completely out of the blue, says, what you talking about? Say, oh, this is, this is what's going on, even if it's an awkward conversation. I put these up here because these are the five guidelines I have on the what's your call um, sort of lemonade booth back there, right? Uh, but there are also ways that God speaks to us. These are the ways God speaks to us. There's circumstantial signs. Counsel of the saints, common sense, compelling spirit, uh, commanding scripture. These are the ways that God speaks to us. It's also the ways that we're called to discern because it's the ways God speaks to us. And so when we go through a difficult time, the question is, what is God saying to me through these things? And that's the path as the spirit of God speaks to eventually get into a spot where we are up again. According to church tradition, Cleopas eventually started a church in his house in Emmaus. Now, we don't know for sure if that's true, aside from archaeology, right? And it doesn't really matter. But eventually, these guys realized that Jesus is alive. He sent his spirit to live in them. He equipped them to live and to deal with the difficulties of life. As we go into this period of Palm Sunday, when we have the palm branches and the kids are waving, and we celebrate who Jesus is, and if you go into Easter and celebrate the resurrected Jesus, what I want to invite you to do is very intentionally embrace, embrace any reality in your life that's filled with difficulty in such a way that you invite Jesus Christ in to speak to you through these ways. He might not show up to walk with you, or he might. He might not give you visions like he's given the Muslims in other countries, or he might. But if you ask Jesus to speak into your life through his Holy Spirit, he will do one of these things. It's how he works. There's no doubt about it. will he speak to you, will he not. It's how he works. And the first couple times this happens, you'll think, oh, well, that was just coincidence like I did. You'll think that, that was probably just coincidence that he answered that prayer. But after five or six times, you'll think, ah, oh, God is actually uh, speaking to me. And scripture, of course, is always the foundation, right? So you don't do things that aren't according to scripture. But as you go through difficult times in life, you think, God, speak to me, speak to me, give me strength. And he will, over time, speak to you and give you strength. This is the story of Jesus. This is the story of Easter. It might be some different things than you realize. It might challenge your worldview. It might even break your worldview. But this is what the gospel is. So we get to celebrate communion this morning. We get to break bread and receive from Jesus his gift. And as you know, the bread is not the physical body of Jesus Christ, but he is spiritually present. And so when you take the bread, when you take the juice into you, what you are saying is, Lord Jesus, I want to receive you in such a way that's so deep, so profound, so stunning that you are actually inside of me, becoming part of my very flesh and spirit. And you're also inviting Jesus into your life to speak to you and convict you and inspire you and equip you and set you free from stuff in your life that you never thought you could be free from. And so am I. And so am I. Uh, just because I'm a pastor <laughs> doesn't mean I don't have difficulty in my life. Uh, this week as I went through some incredible highs, I also went through incredible difficulty in uh, just terms of trying to sort a few things out. And we all need, we all need this insight, this strength in the life so that we can follow him. So I'm going to leave this up there for just a minute as I'm praying that we can keep your eyes open and write some things down if God speaks to you. And then uh, worship team will come up I'm praying and we'll, uh, we'll participate in communion. So Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that you are God. 
We thank you that even though you haven't promised us uh, perfection, even though you haven't promised us that we won't have any trouble, you have promised to be with us. You have promised to help us grow. You have promised to help set us free. You have promised to speak to us by your spirit and to be our counselor. And this morning as we prepare ourselves for communion to receive you, we pray that you'd speak to us. We pray that you first speak to us with conviction. And we confess. Confess, Lord. Like Moses prayed earlier, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just. We'll forgive our sins and heal us from all unrighteousness. Lord, we ask that you would speak. Ask that you'd speak through scripture. Ask that you'd speak through counsel of the saints. Ask that you'd speak through common sense or things that we just know at work. Ask that you'd speak by your spirit. That you would compel us. That you would urge us. That you would guide us. That you would inspire us. We ask that you'd speak through uh, circumstantial signs. Lord, we ask that you would give us a sense of where to go. We also ask that you give us uh, dreams or visions or whatever you want to give us. We ask that you'd speak insight into our lives where we so desperately need it. Ask that you'd hear relationships in our lives that are just a tangle of confusion and, and hurt. Ask that you'd help us as a church to continue to embrace your spirit and allow you to move through us with your power. Ask that you'd set us free from the power of temptation, of sin, of death, the power of the devil. But I ask that you'd be with those of us who are or aren't here who are just coming out of that power, as you would set us free, strip off of us the sin that so easily entangles and help it to be easier to resist. And I would pray that you'd set us free to be, I guess to blossom is the word, to become who you've called us to be. Though the analogy of that, the bud turning into a flower is uh, so apt but only you know what's inside, and as it unfurls, it's absolutely miraculous. And I pray that you would do just that in some of our lives that need it so much. I ask that you to allow us to blossom and become the beautiful person you called us to be. Let I pray that uh, people that are attacking us, whether it's neighbors that are crazy or family that's uh, not so functional, I pray that you guard us from that and you allow us to have uh, boundaries, equip us to do that so they don't come after us as much. I pray that you allow us to space to blossom and space to be who you've called us to be. Lord, your power is literally the power of the universe. Lord, you can create planets. You can move stars. I pray that you'd move in our lives as only you can do by your spirit. Lord, we turn to you and ask that you would indeed move in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.